The thing about days where tragedy strikes is that they usually start out like any other. For a family in southern France, March 18th, 2015 was one of them. A mother and a father who went to work as usual, their three boys finishing a day at school. There was nothing to suggest that in just a few short minutes, their life as they knew it was about to change forever. This is the Case Remains podcast, episode 12, The Disappearance of Lucas Tranche. The year was 2015. The town, Bagnol-sur-Sez, to the west of the Rhone River in southern France. Bagnol-sur-Sez is the quaint kind of town that's typical of the region, with historic buildings, terraced cafes and pedestrian shopping streets. Among its 18,000 inhabitants were the Tranche family, made up of Natalie and Eric, both engineers, and their three teenage sons. The youngest, Lucas, was 15 years old. Lucas was a student at the local lycée, the French equivalent of high school, and was almost at the end of his first year there. He was an animal lover who wanted to be a vet when he left school, and a good student. He is described by his parents as a happy, kind and rounded young man. He was introverted but sociable and took part in his local scout troop, swimming and badminton clubs. On the evening of Wednesday, the 18th of March, Lucas had swimming practice with his older brother, 17-year-old Valentin. They were running late and Lucas told Valentin to go on ahead of him, telling him that he'd catch up with his brother at the bus stop. Lucas locked up the house and left her just after 5pm on his scooter, but he never made it to the bus stop. Valentin tried to call his brother at around 5.30 to find out where he was, but could only get through to his voicemail. Analysis of Lucas's phone would later show that it had been turned off at 5.15pm, just minutes after he left the house. Thinking that Lucas had simply decided not to come, Valentin went on without him and headed to the swimming pool alone. Their mother, Natalie, returned home from work at around 6pm and found the house exactly as she expected, the front door locked and nobody home. After a couple of hours, she went to the bus stop to pick up her sons from their swimming practice, only to discover that Lucas had never showed up. Natalie called round his friends, who had no idea where he was, and contacted the local hospital to see if he'd got into some kind of accident. With no sign of Lucas, she and Eric reported their son missing later that same evening. Once word got out of his disappearance, a neighbour reported seeing Lucas as she stood at the bottom of her garden between 5.15 and 5.30 that evening. She said that she was absolutely certain it was him. She said she saw him walking with a backpack towards the vineyard, which is in the opposite direction to the bus stop he was meant to meet his brother at. Wherever he was going, it seems as though he had no intention of going to the pool. His swimming gear was later found at home. His ID and savings were also in the house, and it's believed that he had no money on his person. If he did take a backpack with him, which other subsequent sightings suggests he did, it's not clear what he put in it when he went. Searches were organised within days of Lucas's disappearance, with teams scouring the nearby hills and cliffs with the help of volunteers, sniffer dogs and helicopters. With no sign of the teenage boy, a criminal investigation was opened by French police. Lucas didn't fit the profile of a runaway. He had a stable family life, friends and was doing well in school. As a result, the investigation launched was one of kidnapping. There was no sign of a struggle in or around the tranche home. A few days after he disappeared, police used luminol throughout the house to see if there was any evidence of blood and found nothing but a trace of what could potentially be blood by Lucas's bed. However, they couldn't confirm if it was in fact that or just a reaction from the luminol with a household cleaning product. They ended up retesting the genetic material in 2017 but never released the results to the public. At first, Natalie and Eric thought that Lucas may have left home on some kind of man-versus-the-wild survival expedition. Lucas was a nature lover and a keen scout, and had been involved with his local scout troop for a number of years. But his knife and sleeping bag had also been left at home. 
indicating that he wasn't planning on being outside for any extended period. As time passed, his parents had no choice but to let go of that hope. Speaking to Metro News a year after Lucas' disappearance, Natalie said, Three days, a month maybe, but a year? No, we don't believe that anymore. By that point, they thought it was likely that foul play was involved in Lucas's disappearance, that he had wanted to go for a walk rather than go swimming with his brother and had stumbled across an unsavoury character along the way, or perhaps even set up a meeting himself. Maybe some kind of hunting accident or perhaps a hit and run. Unfortunately, a year after he vanished, there was still no evidence to suggest that any scenario was more likely than the other. Lucas was an avid Snapchat user, and the French authorities contacted the US to order access to the teenagers' conversations on the app, which are normally deleted as soon as they are read. Their findings were sent over to France in February of 2016, but unfortunately they didn't provide any more clues. Lucas hadn't arranged any kind of meeting, at least not on Snapchat. According to his friends and family, he rarely used any other social media platform. His computer and tablet were also seized at the beginning of the investigation, but didn't turn up anything of note. Lucas's case was a fairly high-profile one in France, particularly in the South, and as a result, there have been many sightings called in in the years that have followed. However, it's the ones nearer to the time of his disappearance that held the most weight. As well as the sighting from the neighbour, there are a few other key sightings for the police to look into, and four that Lucas's parents believed to be credible. One came from Thursday, March 19th, at around midday. That's the day after Lucas disappeared. A woman was ironing in front of a window on the first floor of her farm, which is around 500 metres away from Lucas's road. In the distance, she saw a person crossing a lot at the front of the building. She gave a description to the police of a teenager dressed in what looked like a burgundy jacket with an almost shiny quality to it in the sun. Lucas had been wearing a reversible jacket, one side grey and, sure enough, the other side burgundy. She didn't see the boy's face, but described him as having straight hair, which Lucas had. The woman hadn't seen the news that the boy was missing, and only realised after she spoke to a relative that she may have seen the missing teenager. She contacted police, who immediately launched a search with sniffer dogs. They followed a trace for one kilometre to the north before they stopped. A private dog team took over from around 9pm in the evening until 2am in the morning, but they couldn't follow the trace any further. The next credible sighting came just under a week later, as a group of volunteers were driving around the Saint-Gervais landmark at around half ten in the morning. The group saw the profile of someone in the distance at the edge of a wooded area, turned towards a group of workers in a vineyard. They couldn't see him well from where they were, but said that he was about the size of a teenager and that his clothes looked grey at the top and dark on the bottom. But by the time they got to where they had seen him, the person had disappeared. That afternoon, sniffer dogs were again sent to check out the sighting, where one of them marked a trace at the location the mysterious person had been seen. The next sighting was called in from March 25th, by then a week since Lucas had disappeared. A biker said that he'd seen a teenage boy with a backpack between 5.15 and 5.30pm, walking along a path that led to an isolated hill. The area was around 17 kilometres away from Lucas's home and would have taken him about four hours to walk. The biker knew the countryside well and remembered the sighting as it was unusual to see a young man out in such a desolate area, particularly in the evening. A couple of days later, the man saw Lucas's missing persons poster in his local bakery and got in touch with police. His description of the boy was highly accurate and included details that hadn't been released to the public. That Friday, two days after the sighting, the area was searched with sniffer dogs and a helicopter, and police canvassed the area, talking to residents to see if anyone else had seen Lucas. Samples were also taken from a hut in the area, used as shelter for walkers and hunters. But despite their swift response and thorough investigation, no further clues could be found. 
The last credible sighting was made on March 28th, when a man and his daughter, who had met Lucas before, thought that they saw him at Cultura, a bookshop, around 40 kilometres from the teenager's home. They said that he was with a woman, aged between 45 and 50 years old, but neither the sighting of Lucas nor the woman has ever been verified by police. Months went by with no new information in Lucas's disappearance, until October 2015, when an anonymous letter arrived at the Tranche home. It said that Lucas was alive and well, and that there was no need for them to worry. Over the next nine months, the family received a total of 11 letters, at first filled with promises that Lucas hadn't come to any harm, but later changing their tone, becoming critical of the investigation, and then suggesting that Lucas had refused to see his parents again. Naturally, police were eager to speak to the person sending the letters to find out what they knew. They eventually managed to track down the sender after he was caught on CCTV at the sorting office where the letters were posted. The 57-year-old man, a former supermarket employee, was taken into custody, where police soon discovered that he was little more than a liar. He was charged with what translates as violence with premeditation and stood trial in October of 2017. A psychologist who had examined Lucas's parents, Natalie and Eric, described how discovering that the letters were a hoax had revived their suffering over losing their son. Addressing the court, their lawyer, Isabel Mimran, said, Between hope and confusion, Eric and Natalie Tranche have experienced a new descent into hell, an agony of anxiety. Mimran addressed the defendant in court and asked him if he had ever even met Lucas. After a few seconds of silence, he let out a barely audible no. His lawyers asked for leniency, describing a socially isolated man with no friends or family who lived in a fantasy world. Two psychiatric reports, however, stated that he wasn't suffering from any kind of mental disorder. The man tried to explain his actions, saying that he thought that he was helping the family and that if he thought there would have been any negative consequences, he never would have done it. I invented everything, he said, but it was to help Lucas's parents in their distress. Now I realise that I shouldn't have. I didn't want to hurt them. I'm sorry. The man was sentenced to one year in prison with another year's suspended sentence and forbidden to contact the Tranche family ever again. Eric and Natalie chose not to appear at his sentencing. Following their conversations with residents in the neighbourhood, police announced that they wanted to speak to a man who'd been spotted in the area at the time of Lucas's disappearance. An e-fit of the witness was released to the public, describing him as a man of about 40 years old, bald, with tattoos on his arms. Police never revealed why they thought he may have been of significance. It appears that he'd been seen at the bus stop on the day Lucas went missing, though one news outlet states that there were reports of the man acting suspiciously at a lake near to the Tranche home about four hours before Lucas vanished. They also described a car connected to the man, a blue Citroen or a Fiat Panda, registered in an area just a couple of hours' drive away. The effort of the man was released towards the end of 2016, but police didn't locate him until more than two years later, even though he turned out to be a resident of Banyol Cerces. The man was arrested and taken to the station for questioning. He was there for a whole day before he was released without charge. Almost exactly a year after Lucas disappeared, another tragedy struck under eerily similar circumstances. On March 1st, 2016, 16-year-old Antoine Zoya left his home in Clarensec, a village about 40 miles away from Banyol Cerces, telling his brother and his father that he would be coming home soon. At 4pm, he was seen at a local tobacconist buying a lighter, but after that, he disappeared without a trace. At first, it seemed as though there may be a link between the disappearances of Lucas and Antoine. Not only were the boys similar ages, but they also seemed to have similar personalities, going by descriptions from their family and friends. Their disappearances seemed far too coincidental, 
and some began to question whether there may have been a serial killer in their midst. Police, on the other hand, already had a suspect in mind. If you listen to episode 8 about the unsolved shootings in Annecy, France, you may remember the name Nordal Lalonde. Lalonde was an ex-soldier who served in the K-9 battalion of the French army until the mid-2000s. Shortly after he left the army, he found himself on house arrest when he and two others set fire to a snack bar in Isère. Years later, in August of 2017, Lalonde was in attendance at a wedding in the same region, along with a couple hundred of other guests. One of those guests was eight-year-old Melis de Araujo. It was about 3am when Melis's parents lost sight of their little girl and raised the alarm about an hour later. After interviewing 250 of the guests at the wedding, police zoned in on Nordal Lalonde. Lalonde's car had been meticulously cleaned, In fact, he'd spent two hours scrubbing it down in full view of a petrol station's CCTV camera. He'd used so much bleach to clean his car that two police dogs became seriously ill after searching it. Despite his efforts, police were still able to find another person's DNA on the dashboard. DNA belonging to Melis de Araujo. CCTV footage would later show him leaving the wedding with little Melis in his car, while analysis of his phone showed that he'd switched it into airplane mode around the same time, only reconnecting it 39 minutes later when he returned to the wedding alone. At first, Nordell denied any involvement, but finally confessed to murdering Melis on the 14th of February 2018 and led police to her body. He told the police that he'd killed her involuntarily but refused to give any more details. At trial, he said that he'd taken Melis to see his dogs, but that she had begun to panic and scream, so he hit her in the face, accidentally killing her in the process. Nordal was taken to a psychiatric hospital, where he stayed until July that year, before he was eventually moved to prison. It was later revealed that just a month before the murder, Nordal's ex-girlfriend had lodged a complaint about him to police, on the grounds of him endangering the lives of others with immediate risk of death. As police started to look into other crimes in the area, they began to suspect that Nordal may have been responsible for more than one murder. An examination of his phone revealed that he'd been in the same region as 23-year-old Arthur Noye when he had vanished after visiting a disco in April of 2017. His skull was found by hikers just five months later. Not only was Nordal's car captured on CCTV near the disco, but he'd made some disturbing searches on his phone in the couple of weeks following Noya's disappearance. Included in his search terms was the phrase, decomposition of a human body. Like with Melis, he denied any involvement, saying that he'd given Noya a lift from the disco, but that was it. Eventually, however, a month after he admitted to killing Melis, he also admitted to killing Arthur Noye. Again, he said he'd done so accidentally. He was charged with the murder in December that year. Could Nordar be connected to Lucas and Antoine's disappearance? Lalonde had a cousin in Bagnosa, says, and had visited the area on several occasions. He was also a regular on the party scene in Montpellier, just a couple of hours' drive away, and was frequently spotted in its restaurants, bars and nightclubs. Nordal was already suspected of more murders than the two he'd been convicted of. He is officially a suspect in the disappearance of two men in 2011 and 2012 and has been linked in the press to no less than 11 other disappearances. Police reassured Lucas's parents that they were looking into this lead, but an examination of his phone records later indicated that Nordal was not in the area at the time of Lucas's disappearance. Instead, they placed him in his air, which is about a three hours drive away from where Lucas was last seen. In February 2018, Lalonde was cleared of any involvement with Lucas Tranche's disappearance. While Lucas remains missing to this day, Antoine's family would finally get some answers, though not the ones that they had hoped for. In October of 2018, more than two and a half years after he disappeared, 
Hunters found skeletal remains hanging from a tree in hard-to-access part of a forest. Clothes, a school bag and a knife belonging to the teenager were found next to the skeleton, and dental records lead to confirm that the remains were that of Antoine Zoya. The forest he'd been found in was located in Clarensac, the very same village that he'd disappeared from in March of 2016. The disappearance of Lucas Tronche is a frustrating one, characterised by a series of seemingly promising leads that eventually just led nowhere. Throughout the investigation, police have collected hundreds of statements from Lucas's friends, family, schoolmates and residents in the area. The police investigation is still very much active, with Nîmes prosecutor Eric Morel stating that Lucas's disappearance is still a priority for the judiciary. Just this year, police conducted another search of the Tranche home and held a new reconstruction of the events of 18th of March 2015. When pressed, the public prosecutor refused to comment if this was done in response to any new information in the case, or indeed if any new information was uncovered. Lucas's disappearance has captured the hearts of the French public, with people around the country showing their support taking photos with Lucas's missing persons flyer and posting them online. Posters bearing Lucas's image can still be found on homes, cars and buildings in the region, and there is an engaged community of people invested in the search. March 2019 marked four years since Lucas was last seen, just one month later, his 20th birthday. To mark the anniversary of his disappearance, there was a rally in the town square of Badnosa, says. More than 400 people turned up to pay their respects, spelling out Lucas's name in brightly coloured balloons before releasing them into the sky. His face has now appeared on television screens, billboards, lorries, posters and placards in over 1,000 towns across the whole of France. Each bear the same image of Lucas, dressed in his burgundy jacket and smiling into the camera. A 15-year-old boy frozen in time, while life goes on without him. Thank you so much for listening to the Case Remains podcast. You can keep in touch over on Instagram and Twitter with the handle Case Remains, or you can sign up for my newsletter at www.caseremains.com, where you can also find write-ups on missing persons cases and unsolved mysteries. If you have a couple of minutes to spare please go ahead and leave us a review as it helps others to find the show. Until next time, stay safe.